I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Spartacus Olson. And this is Across the Airwaves, a sub-series of World War II in real time. And War Against Humanity. Where we read out some of your best, most interesting, and most enlightening comments to bring them to a wider audience. Do we comment on them? Yeah, well, we, we have to do some work. Uh, v. Athanasi. Oh, that's Volantis. Okay, yeah, he, he writes, well, he writes comments to us all the time. Okay, uh, hi. Hi, Volantis. Uh, I've been enjoying your coverage of Operation Barbarossa. I noticed that one of your sources is David Glantz. I really like his books, too. He does go into depth, though, into areas that you have mentioned in passing, but not covered in details yet. Okay. And I wonder if you will. Things like the relocation of the factories from the west of the Soviet Union into its interior. This is taken from Glantz. Maybe you can use it somewhere if you talk about it. I like the two it's in that sentence. Oh, it's a quote, okay. Prior to the German invasion, the vast majority of Soviet manufacturing capacity was located in the western portion of the country, particularly major industrial areas such as Leningrad and the eastern Ukraine. And as early as June 24th, the GKO created a council for evacuation to relocate these plants eastward to the Urals and Siberia. The task of coordinating this massive undertaking fell to N.A. Voznesensky, the council's deputy chairman, the future premier A.N. Kosygin, oh yeah, we see him in the Cuba crisis series, yeah, uh, controlled the actual evacuation. Voznesensky and Kosygin had to do more than simply move factories and workers, however. In the centrally directed Soviet economy, nothing would happen without careful advanced planning to ensure that these factories would mesh with existing plants and raw material supplies in the new locations. Workers had to be housed and fed in remote towns whose populations tripled overnight. Electric plants had to keep operating until the last possible moment to facilitate dismantling in the old locations, then be moved and reassembled at the new sites. All this had to be done at a point when the industrial sector was shifting gears to accommodate wartime demand and the periodic loss of skilled laborers to the army. The most pressing problem was the evacuation of the factories, especially in the Lower Dnieper and Donbass regions of the Ukraine. The long lines of railroad cars massed in the region puzzled German reconnaissance aircraft. 8,000 freight cars were used to move just one major metallurgy complex from Zaporozhye in the Donbass to Magnitogorsk in the Urals. The movement had to be accomplished at great speed and despite periodic German air raids on the factories and rail lines. In the Leningrad area, the German advance was so rapid that only 92 plants were relocated before the city was surrounded. More than 500 firms and 210,000 workers left the Moscow area in October and November alone. All of this machinery arrived in remote locations on a confused, staggered schedule with only a portion of the skilled workforce. In total, 1,523 factories, including 1,360 related to armaments, were transferred to the Volga, Siberia, and Central Asia between July and November 1941. Almost 1.5 million freight cars were involved. Even allowing for the hyperbola so common to Soviet accounts, this massive relocation and reorganization of heavy industry was an incredible accomplishment of endurance and organization. Wow, that was, a, that was quite a piece. That was a lot. Um, and you are right, though. I have only mentioned the relocation and not gone into any detail. I keep pushing it back week after week from talking about it since the regular episodes have been longer than they were pre-Barbarossa. And it seems like that's gonna continue though. So, um, but thanks for bringing it up because it is very important. Moving 1500 factories away from the clutches of your enemy into your own interior is an amazing feat that certainly had, eventually, a big effect on the war. Heck, okay, picture one factory, right? Picture in your head a factory and think what it would take to move it a thousand kilometers. Now do that 1,500 times. But, you know, they, they couldn't move everything, right? Hence the scorched earth policy for everything left. I know that I mentioned in one episode that the Germans only managed to seize around a thousand locomotives and a big chunk of them don't even work, mainly from sabotage. And the German rail system is smaller gauge, so they can't use their own trains. And, and you can't evacuate, for example, a coal mine, right? And way more than 50% of the Soviet coal supplies come from the Donbass region. So things like that would sadly have to be destroyed 
and then both they and the Germans would go without that coal. A lot of the sabotage was things like the locomotives. Well, it was transportation stuff in general and the electric grid, right? Turbines, steam generators, that huge dam on the Dnieper. And you hear a lot about Germany really wanting Soviet oil to continue the war, but they needed other stuff too. Uh, they needed nickel, chromium, iron, and capturing that and taking factories had looked pre-invasion like a great solution to labor and resource shortages back home in Germany. That was pretty optimistic planning, to say the least. Uh, Strelock LP writes, Hi, Indian team. Hi, Strelock LP. Hey, team, Strelock LP says hi. Hi. Okay. See you next time. No, um, okay. Um, concerning your statement towards the fact, oh, I don't know if I like where this is going, okay? Uh, concerning your statement towards the fact that the Wehrmacht had no tank-mounted weapon that could penetrate a KV tank, that is not completely true. Okay, this is news to me. The Independent Tank Destroyer Battalion 521, subordinated to Army Group Center, Panzer Group 2, 24th Motorized Corps in support of 3rd Panzer Division, okay, pays to be specific, yeah had two Dicke Max prototypes. They fielded a 10.5 centimeter K-18 artillery gun on a Panzer IV chassis with 50 millimeters of front armor. It was deployed as a heavy tank destroyer and infantry support gun. This gun could penetrate the KV's 90 millimeter of armor at a range of more than 2,000 meters, two kilometers. 111 millimeters at 2,000 meters, 155 millimeters at 500 meters. Well, yes, there were only two of them, okay, at all, and one was destroyed just four days into the campaign. But your strict thesis is not correct. Okay. Additionally, the Wehrmacht fielded the Panzerjäger 1, which was a Czech 4.7 centimeter gun on a late Panzer I chassis. They had an armor-piercing capability comparable to the newest Panzer III, up to 59 millimeters at 500 meters, 41 millimeters at 1,000 meters, but no armor whatsoever. They were organized in independent tank destroyer battalions, like the mentioned 521. 202 Panzerjägers were built in total. I have yet to find a number of vehicles in June 41. As you mentioned, the Stug 3, of which by this point only around 400 were built in total and some lost in France, it is only fair to mention its little brother that was employed in the same manner. Yeah, okay, that's fair to mention that. Although this one could not, this one could not pierce the, the KVs. That one couldn't. In all other respects, this was a very enjoyable episode. Well done. That was a great comment. And yes, I stand corrected. I, uh, so there were, they did have two and only two tank mounted guns that could pierce a KV tank's frontal armor had they encountered a KV tank. And one of them was destroyed within the first four days of the war. But you didn't tell us what happened to the other one. What about the other one? Well. Let us know in the comments. Under our video SS Forum Fighters, CKJ Media comments. I am from Norway and my grandfather was in the SS. We think he was a corporal based on a picture of him in uniform and info from Wikipedia, but we're not sure. We have found the following awards. Again, info from Wikipedia. Iron Cross Second Grade, Eastern Front Medal, we know he was stationed at Leningrad in 1943, Infantry Assault Badge, Silver, and Wound Badge, he got shot in the shoulder. We also have diaries that he wrote during the period and a bunch of letters. The problem is that my grandfather's handwriting is very poor and in the diaries he tends to switch between German and Norwegian. The letters have also been censored by the German authorities. We do not know why they signed up, but the general excuse was that they wanted to protect Norway from the Soviet Union. After the war, he was sentenced to three years of hard labor, which according to him was like being in a summer camp. I don't think he enjoyed it, but apparently it wasn't as bad as the authorities intended it to be. Anyway, he was always good to the family. He even taught me to play golf. There was some noise around the dinner table when my father joined the Norwegian Communist Party, AKB, in the 70s, but it wasn't really a problem. He was also very positive that my father married my mother, who is from the Philippines, and he had no problem with my father hiring a Jew. My dad owns an eyewear shop. We may find some answers in the diaries and letters, or maybe not. It is quite possible he was a different person at the front line than he was with the family. 
I doubt we will ever get any definitive answers. Reality tends to defy simplicity. When it comes to things from that period, we will probably donate it to the Norwegian Holocaust Museum after we have gone through it. Thanks for sharing that. I think it's pretty telling for many of the experiences that veterans of the German forces have gone through after the war. The war changed people, and even those involved in the most heinous parts of it, perhaps not those that actually did the work, but many of those that were in the vicinity of it, came to realize how wrong it was. And I think that's one of the reasons that we need to remember that what they did and, and the sacrifice that so many people put down for this war can never happen again. So for everyone's sake, think of that. Under the video Barbarossa, Hitler's and Stalin's Hell on Earth, Fred Aaron comments, My mom lost two uncles and a number of cousins who were in Warsaw when the war began. We're not sure if they died in the Warsaw Ghetto or killed during the uprising or perished at Auschwitz. All we know is that none of them survived and all we have is one lone photograph of them. Thank you for keeping the memory of the barbarity of the Holocaust alive and for giving the topic the immediacy, context, gravity and respect it deserves. There are two survivors at my synagogue, one of whom wrote a memoir of his survival of the camps. His brother didn't survive and he takes it his task to keep his brother's memory alive as well as those of all the others who perished. At every bar and bat mitzvah, he gives the honoree a copy of his books and tells them that they have the duty of making sure the world does not forget since they are members of the last generation that will have personally known a survivor of the Holocaust. Please keep up the great work. Never forget. First of all, sorry for your family's suffering, and, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I was, of course, born, I was born not so long after the war, and I've met many survivors of the Holocaust, perpetrators of the Holocaust, uh, both in my youth and, and as an adult. And it's part of the memories of meeting them, of talking with them, that keeps me motivated to do what we do, as horrible as everything that we cover is. It's really important that we, the last generations that will have met the people who lived through this, help to keep them alive so that they didn't die for nothing. Under the video Barbarossa, Hitler's and Stalin's Hell on Earth, Henrik G. comments, an extremely strong video that leaves you shocked about how cruel humans can be. It is beneath the surface in all of us, I hate to say. We are the descendants of genociders and murderers, or we wouldn't be here. That is why human civilization is such a precious thing that we must preserve at all costs. I applaud you for speaking about the horrible atrocities on either side. Never seen that before. Yeah, I think that's... Thank you, first of all, for, for the kind words. Um, it's really important to remember that about World War II. World War II is not just, you know, all nasty people against all good people. The lines are really blurred. And when we started doing this, we started thinking about doing this many, many years ago. Uh, it was clear that we wanted to get away from telling a national historiography or a one-sided historiography and really look at it from a holistic viewpoint. And when you start doing that, you see the gray zones between the darkness and the light. And all of the war becomes a huge gray zone because dying is horrible. Killing is horrible. And war is hell. It's, it's as simple as that. And there are no good things about it. And it's important to realize that bad things can be done, like you say, by anybody, any of us. Uh, I thought a lot about that when I was younger. I had this like fantasy when I was very young that I would have been with the resistance. I would have joined the side that was fighting against Nazism. But over the years, I haven't really been able to maintain that conviction. I think that if I was born in the wrong time, 
like anybody else, I could have just as well ended up on the side of the Nazis or, or a violent Bolshevik. You don't know. You just don't know. So it is in all of us. And remember that. We'd like to thank the entire Time Ghost community for your engagement. Your posts in our comment section and your dedication to history makes our program complete. Join the inner circle of our community and become part of the force that makes history in the Time Ghost Army on Patreon.com or TimeGhost.tv. Never forget. Mm -hmm.